Welcome to the Tri Tech Games Podcast. This is Bruce. Oh, this is oops. And, <laughs> this is John, <laughs> and this is Blix. Welcome to the, the Tri Tag Games podcast. Your podcast of finding out whether we're doing anything at all or just talking our heads off. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so what's so what's the nice topic, Bruce? Well, the nice topic, I believe, is talking about what our plans are for the Savage World edition of Fringeworthy. Yep. Oh, uh, I guess that's... Why don't you tell us where we are currently? Well, I'd say at this, um, a lot of the main structure is down. Um, the player section is fairly well formed, though I may have to go through and do some more rewrites of it. Uh, I actually did a rewrite again last night of one of the new skills we're introducing to the game. Um, uh, I may actually go through and flesh out the uh, the races. I'm thinking about adding, you know, in the tradition of our, of, of 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 our of our great of our great uh, uh, game designer Richard Tohoka, of adding a new race to the. Oh game. really? Yeah. Okay, what's that? Rats. <laughs> Rats? Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> what's wrong with me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Goofball. But yeah, uh, uh, but not just you know not, not little rats. We're talking rats about three foot to four foot tall. Just like so a rat, like a rat race, like a like a humanoid. Yeah, but Hobbit size. Hobbit size, yeah. They, they, can still, okay. they can still get in the so, places. So, so you, you want Radis Sapiens? Yeah, Radis Sapiens. You know, it's, the reason why is that I'm looking at the various races, and of all the races, I can I see people mostly playing Tzia. Really? Uh, well, okay. Uh, think about it. if you, I'm you know I'm playing into Mixie. Oh dear God, here they come again with their right. forks and torches, or you play or you play a uh, uh, um, slar. Um, well, not slar. I'm turking the playable races. So the, play, the slar. I think a slar is a playable race. Well, we're, in the, in Star, Star Wars, we're making them an NPC race. Okay. So in the future, I think in the in Are later about the Pangolins. No, nah, Pangolus is not a PC race, an NPC race. I'm thinking of the business. Well, you're playing a business, but how many times can you pretend uh, to be? You're talking about the Demixi, right? It, well, the Demixi, yeah, Demixi are, are are hard to hide. I mean, you know, you're what you're a six legged, you know, spite giant spite. Well, are you six legged or five five uh, whatever? You know, you're a giant spider. You know, people we had this discussion. I know we had this discussion. Six legged and two, two arms. arms. Yeah. That's eight. Yeah. Or you play a business <laughs> and you're you're and you're Oh wow, I'm playing the, the the pet elephant with the team again. <laughs> now, Peter, you might Peter, you might want to disable your video while you're doing that. Wait, I'm also a... What? Because every time you make a noise is grabbing your video. Sorry. You can mute your microphone separately too. What's that? You can mute your microphone separately as well. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm done. I'm just trying to figure out my setup here. I had, um, I had, oh, never mind. Don't worry about it. I'm just playing with settings. I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. I was just getting, never mind. Just, just go. <laughs> All right. So you say that the, um, uh, Tazeel is probably the most likely of the alien races that we'd play. Well, yeah, I mean they're they're the most closest to human. And they're, and they're they're a giant lizard. Yeah, they're a giant lizard as opposed to a giant 
to a giant bug and a giant el and a, and a dwarf elephant. You know. Yeah. And, yeah. And the and the key gag, which and are, the key gag. Well, which are about the same size as your radis. Yeah, but you know, key gag will get you know most people don't try. Well, I mean, it'd be toss between who's the key gag or the rats, but you know. It doesn't sound like you really, you know, formulate an opinion on here, John, other than that you want to introduce a new race. Yeah. What does this new race bring to the table that the other races don't? Well, one thing, the key gag, also another... Jeez! What? No. No. <laughs> Just mess with me. Go ahead. Yeah, well, Peter, you might want to move a little further back away from your mic. Yeah. Uh, from the mic? The mic, yeah, you're you're overblowing it. Yeah, am I? Oh, all right, I can fix. Hold on, I can. I think I can fix that. Hold on, that's fine. I can fix that. Or the mute your mic first before you move it. <laughs> Sorry, how's that? Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, so well, I, I've been thinking about. It, okay, I'm not saying we're going to do it or not, but I've been thinking about. It. One of the reasons is that I. Well, the key gag are an NPC race, also. I mean. We, they know they're they're too pivotal to plot pl plots and so forth that uh, it's hard to hand hand the key a, a player character over unless you, unless you're playing middle or late campaign. Then at least then you, then you can just justify playing a key gag or a, or a slark or something like that. But in the early campaigns, they're more of a foil. They're more of a you know they're the reason why you go on an adventure rather than they you they're actual NPCs. Is that is that because of the secrets they know and stuff like that? Yeah, that's the big problem. Uh, slargs are, you know, especially slargs. We we, we all know what slargs are. They're they're you know, you know, and I, I would think that uh, you're assuming that the Kigak know of their, of, you know, of, of their involvement. They may, as we discussed in the podcast, most of them may not even you know may not have known anything about it, and they're like. Okay, our world's being invaded by the Commonwealth. We're being torn away. We're being declared to be the great betrayers of the galaxy. I was just like working a job, man. Like, like <laughs> you know, this, right. that was those guys down at the end of the bar. I mean, we had nothing to do with them. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I can see that. I mean, they don't have to know all those secrets and stuff. I mean, it's it's good for them to know. I mean, and maybe it could be something like. Um, could be something to the effect of uh, they were never told for a reason. Like maybe they were kept secret because they got a big mouth or something. Or well, maybe I, they... I think it's too hard to keep a secret without not telling everybody. I mean, you right. don't want to tell everybody because then everybody's someone's going to slip. Right. You know. So I, I, I figure that whoever did this was this is a black project by the key gag government or a small splinter group. But you know, ultimately it was a. Uh, the the major Kegak population didn't know about it, right? But you know, once you get tarred with that betray, you know that you destroyed billions of people's lives, uh, it's kind of hard to live that down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little a little rough to get past. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's it's kind of a conversation stopper, you know. It's not what you put on your, uh, uh, you know, uh, what is that the. Uh, your CV, uh, in, in, you know, in count, uh, in, uh, the, your your date mail uh, profile, right, right. <laughs> it doesn't go in your business. <laughs> yeah, destroy <laughs> billions of people's lives. We'd like right. to meet you. <laughs> right. Hi, my name is my name is Click Nick. I'm a key gag world destroyer. <laughs> yeah. Not so much. Yeah, I get things. I get things done. <laughs> right. <laughs> or undone. <laughs> that'd, be on your, that'd be on your Craigslist, you know, advertisement. <laughs> All right, so uh, getting back, like, right onto the topic, uh, we well, basically have the race. Radis here. What's that? Radis. Okay, Radis. Tell us more about your rat idea. Well, it's actually, it's not a new one because uh, I, I ran a, uh, a campaign for about uh, five years, and one of the major races was Radis Sapiens, and they uh, they weren't okay. They weren't your stereotypical rats. They were more along the line of uh, of noble savages. They basically, um, but now that thinking about it, that's what the that's what the mouse guard. Well. Yeah, like mouse guard. Yeah, I mean, if you were thinking about mouse guard, but yeah, but then but when you think noble savages, you think Tazeel. 
Right. right. Yeah. It's it's something I probably have to think a bit more about. There is another thing too is yeah. that is that I wasn't the the creator of the of the race. It was another person, and I probably need to talk to him first before I even consider adding it. Because right. you, you may hey, turn around. Uh, and say, if you want no. a suggestion, I would I would poise them more toward the Robin Hood aspect. Oh yeah, they're not savages. They're just woodsy. <laughs> well, one of the characters was it was a con man, so you know, or con rat, you know. He um, basically was able to, you know, kind of his way. He was into... a grifter. Yeah, he was a grifter, and uh, you know, he he ma he managed to uh, grift his way into as an ambassador from his role to the to the uh, the universal government I had in the, in the game. So it was it was fun. <laughs> you know, John, if you want to get a neat idea on a direction to go mm -hmm. uh, with these rat guys, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of cool. It's just something to think about. There's a short story by Scott Sigler. And I could find out the name for you, but there are these creatures that live. Uh, it's one of his short stories. They live in cities, and um, they one of the things that they're really good at is camouflage and stuff. And they've they've made rudimentary tools, and they live in they they actually live in urban areas, but nobody's ever seen them because they have ways of camouflaging themselves to look like a newspaper blowing along the ground and stuff. It's actually a really cool little story, um, and you know if you liked it. That might be a neat way to go with them. You know, they're they're not. You can make them be kind of neat. They might not be woodsy. They might be urbany. They might be good at surviving in urban environments because they have a camouflage ability, which would give them a really neat. That'd be a really neat character to play because you could actually play one of them and move around with the party. And and uh, you know, if you needed to 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 go scout stuff out, you'd have the ability to do that. Yeah, though it does. Sound it's just a, just a thought. Yeah, I mean, it sounds a bit like a borrower though as well. I mean, if kind of. Yeah. Well, it's your idea, so you're going to have to mm -hmm. flesh I'll, it I'll out. Work, I'll work on it, yeah. Now, beyond that, we I am also working on the GM section, which is where we have secrets. Oh, look at that. Yeah. But we're letting all the secrets yeah. out, right? Yeah, which at least as, on much, this as much as we know. Right. But the secrets that we've, we've been given the uh, permission to know. Yeah. And so, or that, frankly, that we do know. But also, <laughs> but also from running a, a Year Zero campaign, um, which unfortunately right now is on hiatus uh, for various reasons. Right. Um, but running a Year Zero campaign, I come to realize that there's a lot, of, you know, I, I'm wondering if the Year of Encounter is way too ambitious. I mean, when they encountered the Victorians, it took them two months before they were done with the encounter. I'm looking, this is and these people, and who else gets encountered in years in year one? I'm going. Uh, it's gonna be hard pressed to get encounter all these people in year one with only two teams, especially when one of those teams is tied up in Victorian England negotiating a, a treaty with the Victorians. Well, I think this is one of those things where you're gonna have to just leave that up to the game master. I mean, we can give them advice. We can say, hey, look, honestly. Most people would probably start their game around year five. Yeah. That's, I mean, if you want to have uh, what we would consider the classic fringe worthy starting campaign, would probably be somewhere around year five. We've got, we found enough people to actually build teams. Yeah. We've got uh, yeah, enough book, relationships. What's that? Yeah, in the book, it's year, in the book, it's year two. Yeah, but I mean, honestly, would that all, would, would they be ready for all that by year two? Well, um, it, it just I mean, I don't know. On, um, I mean, if all you're trying to do at that point is just to go through, make initial contact with the populace, and come back to Earth Prime, you know, it's you're not doing that much. You know, it's it's uh, you could certainly hit four or five primes like they did. Right. Yeah. That's true. Well, it's uh, it's going to be up to the game master, I think. But yeah, you know, year two, uh, I guess yeah, you could do that. Yeah. What well, I might am doing is maybe actually just simply because it is up to the game master, to simply drop year contacted from the from the races right up. You know, let's say you decide as a GM when you encounter each of these races. And right. One of the things I ran yeah. into with them encountering the Mongols was that well, they sort of spilled the beans. And they even showed where the warp was and how big it was. 
and you know that only a fringe worthy can go through it. And I'm looking at this saying, okay, so they find they found six fringe worthy. One of the guys is very good at finding fringe worthy with the, with the crystal key, so he finds six fringe worthy. They go back to to Earth Prime for training. They get, they get taught about all the latest. You know, well, well, not all the latest, but as much information as they can. Actually, it's split between the Earth Prime and Victorian Prime. So, uh, ha the three three guys and three gals. Three gals go to Earth Prime first, then they'll go to Victorian Prime and vice versa for you know training and, and enculturation and so forth. But I'm right. looking, okay, and he and he knows the only fringe fringe where they can go through it, and he's the con. I imagine when they come back a year later to check on him. There'll be about another dozen or so fringery waiting for them, because he'll just simply do the, the brute force method of finding fringeworthy. March, right. march him to the warp. Right. Well. Right. Wait a second. What's the, the uh, uh, what's the tech level here? We're talking 15th century. Okay, it's going to take him a while to get people there. That's true, but you know he'll he'll start he'll grab his, grab the most mobile bunch of them, his army. Yeah, and plus oh, he'll send, know, he'll send his saying. scouts out in all directions. Yeah, but, but yeah. I'm, I'm still saying is that until you, unless you have a crystal, it's really hard to find fringeworthy. I mean, yeah. the brute force method works if you got buses and trains and things like that to yeah. transport a lot of people there quickly and then send them back because you're also going to have to feed them while they're there. Yeah, I mean, it, it is in the steps. So yeah, it would be, it would be a major thing, but I wouldn't put it past them to have at least two or three fringeworthy. By the time they keep, yeah, they're, no, they're, I know. I, I would say that within five years he'd have a dozen. That I could see that happening. Yeah, which does give me an interesting thought that the Erders are not contacted first by the by Idet or by the Victorians. They're contacted first by the by the Mongol by the Mongols. Hmm. That puts a spin on things because <laughs> it is they're in the same line. They're in the same same uh, same node. You know, right. The Mongols are they are the alt platform for the Erders. So true. That, yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing I noticed that my players did is that they're quite open and they had to show off. They showed off the crystal. And one thing I noticed was how many people they dropped the crystal it, into their hands. It's like everybody they met, they said they showed them the crystal, show it didn't work for them. So I started doing a, I did a little head count and realized there's probably a couple hundred people who Right now, I have that one percent chance per year of becoming fringe worthy. Thank you. Know, you know, right? you know John, I, we really need to define that because I don't like that. I, I yeah. really think that in order for that tuning to work, you need to have it on your person for that year. Because yeah. otherwise, because I did that in one of my things, I, I basically passed it around to uh, two thousand people, and we, and of course, they came up with a. Uh, uh, you know, one percent of them came up with like two hundred fringe worthy at the uh, within a matter of, of a few months. Yeah, I mean, some of the people, of course, this was was it Queen Victoria and the Khan. I mean, at this yeah. point, I'm I'm gonna I would say to the GM, you don't roll for this. You decide if you really want to make your make life interesting for the fringe worthy, and decide when they just we say it's you know, 1900 in in, in Victorian prime. And all of a sudden, Queen Victoria, you know, gets a visit, and you know, she notices, and they notice the keys glowing around next to her. She picks it up; it glows. Oh my goodness, Queen Victoria is fringeworthy. She wants to go, and she and she is not amused. And she's not. No, she she wants to go. <laughs> she wants to go visit the UN. Then at that point, I'm sure that the Queen Mother is not amused. Yeah, right. But uh, but Our, her mom. But what? So, but one person I would definitely say would eventually become fringe worthy would be Borden because he's in at least I've had him in written into the game. He hands out the keys. He hands all the keys himself. You know, he locks them away in a chest and he brings out the chest. And he hands out the keys. He's constantly handling those keys. Well, he becomes fringe worthy when the game master needs him to be fringe worthy. Yeah, but you think you screw anybody in the campaign? Yeah, but well, I, I know, I know, but but John's right. I mean, he's he's one that. You could uh, logistically make him fringe worthy at any point because he has the most exposure with the keys, at least on Earth. So it makes sense that if anyone's going to become fringe worthy, he could become fringe worthy at any time. You'll see one. As long as you don't have to keep that crystal on your person. Yeah. 
Yeah, but you'll see if he does give him friends ready, you'll see the happiest Russian you ever seen in your life. Hmm. You probably you'd, you'd have to remind him, put your parka on before you go outside. <laughs> So, portals. <laughs> so, so getting getting back to where we are with things, so that uh, we have we have all the which I, as I understand, it, except for the new races you're talking about, we have all the races done, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all all the NPC and PC races, they're all finished, right? Yeah. And then, um, did we do the? Did we get all the professions finished? The the thing that we were adding, the professional classes. Uh, remember, Sarah's World doesn't have classes. That would. Be, well, I mean, skill. I mean, I meant skills, professional skills. Uh, we can define some. We also can define some uh, professional edges. That That's what I meant. Yeah. Damn it, I keep I keep screwing it up. Yeah. All right. I I think I think we did. Didn't we name a few professional edges, and then we were going to do a couple more? But because I, I think we have a couple of them already. Yeah, they're yeah. in the players' guide. Yeah, there's those, but the, the, and we did add some like uh, there's some specifically for people who drive. There's Ace, but I wanted to give like combat driving as a as an edge, so that's a separate uh, edge you can take as well as Ace, so you can be really good at driving. Yeah. And uh, I think I had one called Explorer. Uh, it's like French Explorer, and what that that one gives you the ability to um, once per session you can do this thing called Scrounge, where basically. Uh, you you can find something that the group needs. So it's like you're very good at uh, finding stuff that people need while you're on the fringe path. Yeah, I may have redefined it a little bit, but uh, I, I'm looking at, at existing edges that do things like that similar similar. Mm -hmm. so it's to make sure that there's a consistency. We don't do something that makes everyone want to take Explorer because we can get free stuff. You know. Yeah, but it's not it's not I meant can to like a tank. No, it's, it's no, no, no. And I think we define it better than that. It was, yeah. it was things like necessity. It was like gasoline or bullets or, mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't anything in in excess. You know, it's not like oh, I can go find a, a whole armory full of weapons. No, you found a pistol. You know, or um, With no bullets. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, 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 it's not it's not magic find. It's scrounge. You scrounged up something. You know, I, I got something really sharp that could be used as a knife. That kind of stuff. I found some food. I found some water. Yeah. You know, it, it's not. It's not meant for that. Of course, we have to define that because then somebody would say, "Well, you know, uh, how how detailed is that?" But we were working on it. We we, we can't. And I can't even remember because I haven't looked at it in so long. I sent John a bunch of stuff, and I know we were trying to vet it out and make sure it wasn't you know duplicate or redundant or made something, you know, something that wasn't already in it Savage Worlds. Probably World. resolve it by simply saying it's a poor quality whatever. Yeah. Because you scrounged it. Right. Well, so therefore it's, you know, useful. It's it, either it's going to be a very high maintenance item or it's going to only, it's only going to be useful for, you know, like once, one session or one, um, right. you know, even one scene if it's, you know, if it's, if it's necessary. Like we need some transportation, and you find an old beat up car. It's like, well, you can use it for now, but it's not going to last very long. Right. So get where you get where you're going. Wherever you want. To, yeah, and where, when you pull into whatever you want to be, all of a sudden the engine starts pouring out smoke. It's like or the right tire like, goes flat. Or any freeze. Right. <laughs> it, it's like a jury rig or like the, the bench stump. Yeah. You know? but what? but for equipment, it's going to work for the scene. It's like a MacGyver. It's basically like a MacGyver stunt where you can build. We can build a one-shot item that yeah. works just for as long as the GM decides it, it will work. Right, right, right. You know, I got I got found us enough pass, water. The patch will only hold so long. Right. I found enough water so that we won't dehydrate today. Yeah. You well, know. That's, that's a survival skill, which is so you got to be careful not to duplicate existing skills. Whoever has survival skill can find the water and food. So what you're, right, looking, okay. what you're looking more for is yeah. the skill that finds you items that are, are you know necessity, but they're not um, things you can find with, with with a skill with another skill. So you right, know, right, right. You don't okay. want to dilute the edges. Right. Because you only have so many edges. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, you get too many edges. Uh, so that's another thing I need to go through and review the edges again and and, and make sure I vet them. Well, make sure also they make sense in terms of not being too powerful. That also everyone just wants to take it and 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 love it to death and use it all over and use it over every, every other edge. But uh, at, so at whatever, the same time, whatever everybody 
wants the same edge, then you know it's too powerful. Right. Yeah. I would I would say that one of the things that we do need to make sure we do is that we add some edges and a couple professional edges. We need, we, whatever we need to do to make that happen. Because I know when I buy a book, when I buy a, like a supplement for Savage Worlds, you know, I want some of that stuff. I don't want just you know just storyline. I, I want to be able to do other things with my character. Uh, right. That's well, sort of like that's where the, the special edges make sense. That's like right. the advanced uh, uh, the advanced classes in the D twenty edition. That's right. where you take the Savage Worlds and you you know you basically mate it to your game uh, your your game. Oh, that's right. And you know, you know, John. Also, I can't remember. Uh, I came up with some. Um, uh, I came up with some French-worthy specific edges too. Like there was one. I think it was. Um, uh, crap! What was it? It was. Uh, there was one that you were. You were immune to a Meller being able to duplicate you. That's a, everyone takes that one. I no, mean, they yeah, don't. Well, why not? What, what, what was what, was was because that's one of your. Because that's one of your edges, dude, and you're only going to get to use it once in a great while. And the only thing it does and is keeps the Meller from copying you. That's all it does. But, it doesn't, but that would be the touch, the leech. It wouldn't keep him from copying you if he ate your skull. Okay. I mean, that would be fair. Okay, well, I'm just saying it's not, it's not super powerful. I mean, it's really... Right, well, that's what I'm saying. Make more sense to say they can't come up and do the uh, the touch it you know the, the touch drain on you. Right. I'm just okay. I guess the point I'm trying to make is if we're not putting fringe worthy specific stuff in it, then what are we doing? Well, let me look at what I have put in there. Because because I was gonna say just write a novel. I mean, <laughs> we, we got to well, put no, some savage worthy fringe worthy stuff. The point. In. The point, Blix, is to is is to uh, change the way the game operates so that it takes advantage of the Savage World system. I, I Look, I, I get that, but I'm saying that yeah. every other Savage Worlds book I have adds edges, and it adds okay. like professional edges and stuff. It, it adds that kind of no, stuff I, to I it. I agree. I think we should. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not, so, not disagreeing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm looking at, uh, let's see here, uh, we have like Doctor Fringe Diplomat, which I think I. Uh, I oh yeah, that was a good one. Yes. Uh, if it's the same as it was, is it the same? Uh, no, I, I think I made some some changes to it. I'm looking at. I'm actually looking at the at the uh, files right now. Uh, you have to be a veteran to take it. You mm -hmm. have to be you have, to be, uh, you have uh, be charismatic. You need a spirit of D8. You need intimidation of D8, persuasion of D8, and streetwise of D8. So wow, jeez. Uh, well, yeah, you need that. Otherwise, otherwise, it gets too easy to take it. Okay, what does it give you? Ah, this, okay. Just, ah, come on, scroll, you bloody thing. It's, unfortunately, it breaks across two pages, so I have to play with it. Uh, let's see. What all do I get? Do you get for this? He's immune. To, okay, French. Okay, he's immune to the shock of being in the presence of other sentients with naturally terrifying forms. So the mixy don't scare him. You know, right. Allows you to blend in. You can basically uh, you can blend. You basically allows you to blend in uh, cultures. You know, like you know, you, you'll sit down ha and have ga with with Klingons and not flinch. Because um, because I, I don't want to duplicate charismatic. I didn't want to duplicate other edges that give you bonuses to things. This one here allows you to um, basically blend in better. Uh, you can make a common knowledge role for an alien culture to understand how things work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you you, you just just got to spend a week there. Once you spend a week there, you can after that you can just make common knowledge rolls and not pick up the wrong pick up the wrong intestine fork when you're at dinner with some with some species. You know, okay. it's, <laughs> it's one of the things. You know, not to eat the chuslex first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't want to duplicate yeah. existing edges. So, yes, you, you uh, know that you're I, supposed I to that. use the, uh, the finger bowl on the left, not on the right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We do have the encounter scrounge out to probably define. Then there's the idea explorer, who basically, now, which is different from fringe explorer, 
Uh, let's see, there you need to be a novice, Smarts D6, Survival D6, Notice D6, and Street Rise D6. No, D8. Maybe I need to change that. Uh, you get a plus two survival, notice, and streetwise skills. So you actually make the D6 instead of D8. All right. So it sounds so, like we need more professional edges. Yeah. Uh, and uh, But otherwise, what's still lacking? Well, we're doing – got the plot points. Now, I I put up two. I got two. I've got – I got two of them that are – Almost finished. I, I got to finish them up, but they're close. So that's four, and these are big plot points. These aren't these aren't like one-page plot points. These are like multi-page plot points. Um, okay. I've yeah. got. Go ahead. Uh, let's see. I I got another one that I just started. You also have. And you also have the little the little, the little ones. The little. And I got the mini miniature ones. I I think I wrote up like ten of those, didn't I? Yeah. So those are like ones you would, you might run in between, or or you can flesh them out. They're like I, I also gave suggestions on how to how to take them in different directions. So you might have a mini one that's like a paragraph long, but then it says you know the next paragraph is you could do this with it, or you could do that with it, or you could do something else with it. Um, so you could flesh out full adventures from it, and most of those you could stick on most any world. Yeah. Now I didn't add your Miller immune, but I did bring in your Miller Hunter. Miller Hunter. Okay. Which what was that again? The Meller Hunter. That's the heroes had a previous encounter with the Meller, and either suffered life force leech by the Meller. Fortunately or unfortunately, the Meller left a piece of of. Uh, let me get here. I'm just clicking myself, so I'm so I have screen time. Uh, left a piece of its genetic matter in the hero, allowing him to detect Meller in disguise after spending a day in close contact with the disguised Meller. Oh yeah, right, right, right. That's a good one. Yeah, so you can just feel that this guy you're talking to ain't right. Right, right. Then there's, improved Miller, a then there's an improved Miller Hunter, which actually gets a bo gets a better bonus. Uh, there's, he doesn't basically you, basically you gotta make a nose minus two, so basically you gotta be a six on your nose roll. Right. You're and, but you don't have to spend any time with him, right? That's you just you can do it any time. Well, no, you still need to spend a day in close contact. You still have to you okay. still gotta talk to him. You got you know. Right. You you gotta find out that it's a uh, that it's a replicant by you know asking all the twenty questions it takes to find out it's a, it's a replicant. Right, right. And just seeing how he moves and noticing that he doesn't do he doesn't do things that other Meller like normal people do. Like for example, like man, you haven't gone to the bathroom all day. What's up with that? That kind. Of, I mean, it's just like stuff you would pick up on that other people might not. Yeah, I did clean up the Meller uh, again. Okay. I had to get, went through another cleanup on their on their stats and abilities. Made sure that it's very that some things are, are like obvious that they're automatic. Like Mellers are always intimidating when it shows up. Okay, you know. And also, I was reading through Richard's write up. It's been in the book ever since he introduced the Meller, and it's never been put as a stat. And that was the Meller can the Meller. You know, even if they're in disguise, if you have an opening about you know uh, about that wide and about that thick, he can get through it. Ah, oh, okay. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Because he, he describes how, how Miller got through a food slot. Right. Which, <laughs> that wide and about that thick. <laughs> you know. All right, so, so, which would put, and which we don't, would put a different spin on your Miller, on your Miller th uh, game adventure for Hatsumi, Bruce. Because if people wow. knew that, well, hey, I just poke a hole in the wall and ooze right through. Well, mm -hmm. they put a hole in the wall. They, they put a hole in the wall. They can just... <laughs> They could just go through the wall. <laughs> yeah. The walls are made out of plastic. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, so what about crystal powers? How are we on those? Those are pretty well defined, though. I, I, I'm, I'm going to review Paul's. Uh, Paul Nunes, uh, you'll probably hear him on a few, uh, He's asked a few questions, and you'll also probably hear him on a future podcast. Uh, he came up with some suggestions for possible crystal powers. I'm right. Dig them out of uh, out of the stream in the in the fringe of the um, uh, fan page and, uh, and on on Facebook and look at the ones and determine if any of them are actually useful or not. You know, they're, if they're not too game breaking. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we also don't want to turn the crystal into a Swiss Army knife. Yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah. We, yeah. Uh, people want to use. You know, crystals can do things, but uh, the other thing I did was is how how you can discover cr crystal powers. 
if you have the right crystal in your hand, you as a player can say, oh, I'm going to try to use this power. Even though you never used it before. You're going to have a, you're going to have a big minus to use it, but if you succeed, you have learned the power, and now you unlocked it. It's like, like, a, like, a, like a video game unlocking. You, you unlocked that power, so now everyone else can learn that power, and then next time they, they, they level, they uh, uh, get, get a, uh, an advance. On their, for their so character. the power wants to be found. Yeah. Yeah, but you have to write. You have to have. You have to have the right key to do it. Otherwise, you know, you can't learn a. You can't learn improve uh, fine fringe worthy unless, of course, you have a key that supports improve fine fine fringe worthy. Is it also going to be requiring a certain level character, as in veteran versus legendary versus anything? Yeah, you have to be able to use that power. So if you're not a seasoned character, if you're not a seasoned character, you can't discover seasoned powers. You can't, do, you know. If you're okay. if it's a veteran level power, you can't discover until you hit veteran. And there are a couple of legendary. So until you get legendary, you're never going to find those powers. All right. So so we got okay, so, so we got most of the powers vetted out. We got a couple that we're going to review. But other than that, we've got a good set of power. We got all the powers that we've had before, and then maybe some new ones, and they're already all taken care of. I think you already got that system completed, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, okay. the, the the power systems. I uh, need to flesh out some more equipment. One thing I discovered after playing for a while and talking to my players, we realized no one's going to ship anything from the United States. It's way too far when you have all of Australia to pull pull junk from. So that's okay. why. That's why after 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 they got the uh, the, the the South Vietnamese um, MR, MRM sixties, otherwise known as the Moscovy, uh, from the from the Vietnamese. Uh, they uh, they also got some some old diesel vehicles a um, Morris a uh, Morris I want to call it a K100 diesel truck from the 1950s that's one of their vehicles they're driving around now um, the the three Muscovies they have four Muscovies now and each one has a different way of starting <laughs> on the fringe paths uh, was it three or four but each one yeah you know, one has a hand crank. Well, actually, yeah. you 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 wind you wind a spring, which then turns the engine over because you don't want to be ha hanging on to that thing. And Excuse then, me, guys. Uh oh, I'll be right back. Yep. Yeah, but the uh, I'm just yeah. right here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we can talk. Yeah, but uh, here. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. Th there's three different ways of starting the Moscovies. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, as far as uh, I mean, I think there'll be major corporations that'll want to donate goods mm -hmm. to the fringe-worthy effort because yeah. of you know, just like people go to Everest, it's a long way away from America too. But you still see lots of Nike and and other types of equipment being you know brought up the mountain. So it really comes down to what kind of sponsorship you got going for you. I'm pretty sure that. If I was a Fringeworthy Explorer, I would be looking for sponsorship. Yeah, I, 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 sorry, yeah, I would agree. You know, of course, there's a limit because uh, how much you know initially because they're, they're going to be wondering. Okay, the first year they're going to you know they'll be feeling it out to feel out how hot the Fringeworthy are. So the first year, I think, is going to be a little bit more feast, you know, more famine than feast. Because everyone's deciding, trying to figure out what the heck is going on and whether or not this is a real thing or this is some elaborate joke. But as, as soon as uh, as soon as uh, it gets going and we start realizing it's real, then you probably see more corporations stepping up to the plate. Right. Uh, I mean, we are talking a very big, you know, range from the zero year experiences all the way up to the late campaign, where most of your gear is probably going to be made off world. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and other sources as well. I mean, you know, the Victorians will be putting out, will be, will be definitely providing lots of stuff that works only on the fringe paths. You know, need a computer? Hey, they'll give you a Babbage. <laughs> you know, just hook it up to your diesel well, motor. You've said that before, John, and, and frankly, I, I I mean, unless you have to have the computer operating on the fringe paths, I'd rather just walk through the portal and just recharge. You know, <laughs> hook it up, hook in a fuel cell, and 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 get my. Uh, Whatever you know, twenty first, twenty second century computer going, uh, you 
Yeah, yeah. You, on the other side, the portal on the world side. I mean, it, it sounds good, but you know, bringing in something the size of a of a stagecoach to be able to do simple calculations is not necessarily a great idea. <laughs> that's well, they actually have smaller beverages, but they're more or less dedicated to telegraphy. But that's you know, that's. Yeah, you know, the, I think that I what I think the beverages will be the most useful would be uh, actually in defense on the fringe pass. Being able to trip a lap, things like the grazing fire, the you know the uh, the various types of of trip wires and stuff like that, and it's going to set off elaborate behaviors of uh, mechanized machinery. It's either going to be powered by gravity motors or steam powered on the actual platforms. Yeah, and that's where I see a lot of usefulness, and also possibly any kind of fringe industry where they need uh, some kind of of uh, computing control, you know that's where they would be useful on the fringe pass. But to your average explorer, you know they're they're they'll wait till they go through the portal. I think. Yeah, actually, I have a theory about the gravity motor because I, cause you remember how resistant I was to the to the concept. I have a feeling Gee, that I can barely remember that, John. Yeah, yeah. but I got a feeling that it's probably not going to be someone from Earth Prime who discovers the gravity motor. It's going to be someone from Victorian Prime because, well. It sort of matches their mindset. Uh, I actually can see one, you know, one of the one of the more one of the more technically minded playing with with um, flywheels and stuff like that, and realizing it's still running. It's, you know, hmm, maybe I can pull work from that. And yeah, developing, that'd be fine, John. Yeah, I mean, it's it's more their I mean, mindset. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's it's fine. I, if you want the you if you want it to be them, that'd be good. It could be any lo actually you know steam age culture even earlier because yeah. you know I, I I would be fine with you giving it to like even the uh, you know, one of the races that people don't think are particularly smart you know because it'd be uh, like you guys are doing all this stuff and I came up with this thing that gives us unlimited power forever. Well, within the limits of uh, friction and uh, like stuff, but yeah. Well, all things are limited by friction and such things. Yeah. Also, <laughs> I feel like if you pull work off of one of these flywheels, it'll start slowing down. So you have to balance your amount of work you're pulling off the flywheel versus, uh, you know. Yeah, that's always true, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's his. Uh, I mean, that's true. That's true that of, of having a uh, a wind turbine. <laughs> Okay, the wind only blows so strong. Yep. Yeah. So. Okay. So, but uh, all right. So, well, what I was kind of thinking would be a good idea, John, would be if we took a, a bunch of our developers and we split up all of the podcasts and say, okay, you're responsible for this range of podcasts, and make sure that all the important points and the information and the ideas that we presented in our last 150 podcasts. Make it into the actual text. Actually, it's not a bad. Basically, idea. review the uh, review the podcast for useful information that should be in this next book. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, that, that's definitely especially in the game master section. You know, there's a lot of stuff in there. I've I've been putting in. Uh... Well, there's lots of great ideas for the players too. For the yeah. for the. The, how to properly explore and some cool things you can do as as a player. Make sure there's cool equipment that you get. You know, because we talked about all kinds of like vehicles and stuff, like making sure you have uh, I don't know whatever vehicle you're gonna need for your location. Like we talked about ultralights in the in the uh, in a I don't know the the. Sky, uh, I don't know, Sky episode, whatever it was, airplane right. episode, uh, yeah. carrying a airplane Zodiac boat. with you. A... Right. Yeah. You're also looking at the fact that it's going to be a bit of a, the initial, the, the initial vehicle is going to be a bit of a junkyard. I mean, basically, a lot of vehicles that, you know, I, I disagree with you, Bruce, on, on, on folks giving up their, their museum quality uh, you know, steam vehicle, but when it sort of runs and kind of runs, and yeah, you know, I never got it to work properly right, but you can have it, and you can try to yeah, make but, it run. And okay, but John, don't don't limit the players because it 
I, I know you want every vehicle to operate on the fringe path and off the fringe path, but it isn't necessary. All they, all they need is one vehicle to trailer the vehicles they're actually going to use for their exploration to the portal. Once they're through, it runs like they does on Earth Prime. It runs like, like they would anywhere. So you really don't have that limitation. Huh. There's no limit to what kind of vehicles they can use. There's just a number, only a very small number of vehicles that can work on the actual fringe path. That's yeah. all. Well, I think just in the first couple of years, though, you, you, they'll be looking for you know work, workable diesels and and things like that, and they'll be, be a, this is co collection of oddball old you know 1950s and 1940s diesels that you know they'll be cobbling together and make work. You know. Right. Well, I'm sure that they're going to want to go toward diesel engines in general because uh, that's going to be their primary repair skill set. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get out there and, and all of a sudden a vehicle stops working. Well, hey, we have this other vehicle over here that we use for exploration, and it's diesel too. We could probably harvest some parts off of it. Or, you know, hey, I know how to fix that because I know how to fix the other vehicle. I mean, if you, you know, if, if you have one person who knows who's an expert in, you know, you have to have an expert in Tesla vehicles. You have to have a person who's an expert in jet engines. You have to have a person who's an expert in all these other things. You're not going to find steam, these people. Okay. And your steam mechanic on top of that. Yeah. Right. So they're probably going to concentrate on the diesel engines just because that way they'll have the right tools to, do, to work on any type of that type of vehicle and they'll have the right experience to do it but that's that's a that's a realistic aspect yeah. okay uh, if the players want to take their skidoos out on on the on the ocean I'm, I'm not gonna stop them one thing I did run into was that the players realized that they're only about you know one bicycle one truck drive away from Hatsumi so as long as they have access to the portal and they need something they'll hop on their bicycle or hop on their in, in their truck and drive there Go back and get some and talk and get some more stuff and come on back, you know. And so right. the first year, well, there's, there's a lot of re, re, there's a lot of um, what's the right word? Um, uh, brain just died. Um, not give me anything, John. They're they're dependent. They're very dependent on Hatsumi for things they forgot. Oh yeah, sure. And you know what? That's, that's what that part. That's what that scrounging edge could really come in handy. Yep. You know what the best part of this video cast is? Our listeners get to see what an unedited show is like. Because <laughs> this is all Maybe the time. Maybe they'll appreciate the show I produce, huh? All right, all right. Now I'm just saying there, there are so many times where we'll, uh, we'll start talking about something and we know exactly what we want to say. It was there. And we'll just hit this wall. It's like, you know, it's the thing with the thing. It's got the, you know, with the, the round thing with the, you know. And <laughs> eventually we, we uh, you know, Look it up, and we're like, "Oh yeah, the blah blah blah," and then Bruce cuts all that out. Yeah, and you never hear any oh, of that. Boys. But okay, so yeah, so I, we've got. I cut out like three minutes of myself rambling on on something, and I said, "I totally, I totally derailed the topic, haven't I?" And everyone kind of grunted. I just so I deleted it out of the end end podcast. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, I, so look, I was yeah. gonna say we, we got we got the setting. We, yeah. we just. We've got basically got the races. I mean, that's pretty much done. We've, we've got mm -hmm. the crystal stuff. That's pretty much done. Um, On the races, I would, I actually would. Every race is a potential plot point, and I think I mean we need to look at them and maybe consider fleshing them out a bit more. They yeah. may actually deserve at least two pages worth of write up. So the GM has well, enough Richard. Information. Richard has something. He he needs to do a plot point. Because he has a big surprise for the Tazeel. Hmm. Hmm. We all look. We all roll our eyes. Yeah. It's a surprise to me. Well, uh, I, I, he told me about it. Oh, but God. so I'm just saying is that that that's one of his. You know, when we hand it off to him and he right, says, right. "Yeah, now I got to do put the dry tech touch on it." Well, right, he's got he's something in. with the Tazeel he's going to add in. Okay. Well. I'm I'm seriously considering writing a Kickstarter so we can pay to get this this thing professionally edited and and taken care of, which means I would need everything, including Richard's surprises. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Well, you know, John. I mean, if we do that, that's fine. We could give Richard everything that we have. Yeah. 
And right. he could add his That's touches, and and then yeah. he could send it to the professional editor. But we we'd have to find a a role playing editor because it can't just be any old editor. Actually, I met a couple at Gen Con. Okay. Oh, well, that's fine. Good. There's plenty that's of people who are in the publishing industry that can that are good editors who might be willing but, to work for us. It just depends on whether how, how much it's going to cost, mm-hmm. you know, and I, whether we raise the money for it. Because Richard's not going to raise the money. For it. And I would say if we do, if we were to do a Kickstarter like that, and we were to get we were to pay for an editor, I think the next thing we should pay for is a layout artist. Yeah. And Someone maybe, who knows typesets. I mean. You know, I know Richard lays his books out and everything like that, but there really is, there really are people who do that professionally, and they really, really know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, I mean, even like books, you, you think about, it, you think about like a like when you buy a novel, the paperback novel. Do you know there's a professional layout artist, and there's a lot of stuff they do that you don't realize, and as long as you read the book and it's nice and smooth, you'll never realize all the stuff they did. But because uh, I, I know one of the, the this woman Donna. Um, she does all Scott Sigler's books, and she does a bunch of other books for other people too. But she was talking about that, and I was like, "Oh my god, I didn't even know that was a thing." You know, something about splitting pages, and sp- I don't know, and, and splitting concepts. Like you don't want a concept to pour from one page to the next, and just there's all this stuff that goes into it that I had no idea. And I'm just like, "Oh my god, that sounds really complicated." She's like, "Yeah," and people who don't do it, they suffer. Yeah. You know, because th- their books, you. If you don't notice it, the guy, the person has done their job perfectly. Yeah. I mean, well, I, that's, I, I, that's I, I, the same are, for the people who do the matte paintings. Right. If you notice their work, they failed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's why people don't they don't think about it because they don't think that somebody did that because they don't notice it, and that's yeah. the whole point. They don't notice it. Oh yeah. One thing All right. Ask, well, we do a Kickstarter uh, also, uh, maybe for artwork. Let's let's hard. try to get one. You know, if we want to do a Kickstarter, let's just do one at a time. Yeah. Yeah, well, they can be stretch goals. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, that'd be great. But I'm just I saying, mean, is that you know, I, I think we should concentrate on the. I mean, if, if you really want to do it, go ahead, uh, because we're basically going to be handing it off to somebody else, and that money is going to go to that person for that for that reason. It doesn't really affect the rest of the job, which is to get the material written and yeah, right. to make sure that all the content we want is in the book. Which again is why I think that we should take the, all of our developers, split up the podcasts amongst them, and make sure that they go through their each section and uh, make sure that that material that we thought was good ideas in the podcast, make sure it gets into the next edition. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, everyone would make it because uh, because 150. It'd be nice to be able to say you don't have to read. I mean, we'd like you to, but you don't have to listen to 150 podcasts. If you buy the next edition, you've got the best ideas that we've come up with in the last 150 podcasts. I mean, right. right now as we stand, I, I have 112 pages done of the book so far, and I'm still looking at yeah. you know more stuff needs to be done. I mean, you know, right? I mean, we definitely need to get the campaign. You know, and campaigns will probably change again because as we as we've been talking in our various podcast in our various podcasts, we're going to realize there's a lot more politics going on in the later years that. It may not resemble the, the the campaign layout we have in the in the D twenty book. There may be some uh, changes there. I, I like to actually include some, you know, some potentials in there, like the the dark fringe, where you know it's like Stargate. No one knows about it because everyone who knew about it is either dead or in, or locked up someplace. You know, and it's being run by the U.S. government. Well, well, the the only the only thing I, I I'm really concerned about is if we let this go like another year. I mean, we've been talking about yeah, this forever, and yeah. We, and honestly, I I would the rather leave. You, Josh, you need to put down some hard deadlines. Okay, even if we don't make the deadlines, the fact that we're going to try to make the deadlines will get us close to those deadlines. Yeah. But without deadlines, it just floats along until another year goes by. Yeah. And I, if, the biggest problem. I think that, I'm a writer, I'm a tech writer by trade, and I and the, and after a long day of writing, sometimes the last thing I want to do is sit down and write some more. I, I was seriously thinking of, and I talked to my, and I actually talked to my boss about this, uh, of taking a sabbatical. I would take really, one month off of work, and then basically just do nothing but work on the on on the game. I can figure, figure I can get a lot of it done in a month, if I you know. 
Uh, I, was I would hope so. Yeah. The big thing there is, of course, I would be without pay for a month. I was <laughs> doing a Kickstarter for that. <laughs> pay my salary for a month. You know, I only need $10,000. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, like if, or if we $5,000, that'd be enough, you know. 5000 We could probably raise 5000 Yeah. Well, then we're not going to raise $5,000 for an editor. Well, I mean, I, true. I mean, keep going back to the same well. Well, no, that's where you that's where you put in a stretch goal. That's where you would say five thousand will get the book finished. Seven, you know, at seven thousand, we'll have it professionally edited. At such and such, you know, you can do that kind of stuff. Well, I'll price out editors first. Yeah. Well, that's fine. yeah. Of course. Like of course. I said, you know, I mean, and that I think you should uh, go ahead and, and explore that option because the worst thing that happens is you're going to find out that. There are not enough people to raise that money, and then that gives us a better idea of how big of a print run we're going to expect, right? Yeah, that's true. But though I have one got, of the things got, like, I actually have got it was a Scott Sigler's book on doing doing uh, crowdsourcing. Was it his book or? Well, I don't know. Yeah, but there, there are ways. There are ways to do it. I mean, I'll send you a link, John. There's. Uh, I went to a page that had Folks, really fancy. We're making sausage fan right now. We're making sausage right now. This is how game design works. We're making sausage. <laughs> but there was there was a um, uh, there's a website where a guy talks about how to raise a hundred thousand dollars in ten days. And I'm not saying that we can do that, but he had some really fantastic ideas on how to raise a, a lot of money in that time and ways to target your audience and stuff like that. Um, and and we can implement some of that stuff. Yeah, I think a lot of it, is, a lot of it is doing a good song and dance, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then having realistic and then having realistic stretch goals. So I, I'm I'm in the I have the fake core. Um, I, I'm in I'm in the fake core one, and there for my eighty five dollars, I'm probably getting a hundred and ten dollars worth of PDFs. Right, yeah. right, right, right. In fact, but that's the thing, and there's some, there's some tricks to doing it to to yeah. convince people to spend a certain amount because of what they get, right? And like you're saying, you got 110 dollars worth of stuff for 85 bucks, so you don't feel bad spending 85 dollars. It's great, you know. Yeah, they convince you to spend that, but it's not like you spent it and you're not getting anything. Yeah, it's like the guys you know. who spent 50 dollars and getting the uh, what should be a 200 dollar game of of uh, ogre. That's mm -hmm. that was a good one. <laughs> Well, Razor's, uh, Razor Coast, uh, the one I just did with Lou Agresto, was, I didn't do it. I mean, I was talking to him about it. I interviewed him about it. And uh, they had a level where if they hit a certain stretch goal that everybody who was who paid $30 was going to get a um, – they would get a, a black and white paperback book. or I think that was the case. Mm -hmm. But um, they made so much money on their stretch goal that everybody who spent that 30 bucks is actually going to now get a hardbound color book, full-color book. Because they made enough on the stretch goal to do that, but you had to be in at that level. So I forget what it was. Maybe not even thirty. It might have been fifty. But whatever it was, uh, yeah, they got a really yeah. they got a really good deal. I've priced books in in in, in the print on demand that like Lulu and stuff like that. If you do, if you're hitting 120, 200 pages, fifty dollars sounds about right for a color book. Yeah, but they got all kinds of other stuff with it too. They were getting yeah. you know, this and that, and a map and something else and something else and something else, and that's all. Most of that stuff came from stretch goal from the stretch goals that they hit. It's yeah. like, well, that money you spent, you hit this stretch goal, now you're getting this. And you hit that stretch goal, now you're getting this. So people were like, well, I went in at the, that level, yeah, uh, and it worked out in both directions. No, I understand. A lot of the stuff is digital, so there's what you're doing is you know. It's it's a it's a gaming tradition where I call the fame and fortune contract, where you're famous, you'll be famous if you're fortunate enough to get, in the, get your name in the book. And so hmm. a, lot of these, a lot of this digital stuff that's not being printed. So right. production cost is just labor and and layout right. at that point. Right. You know, so it's it's a lot cheaper to do to do that. And I'm not putting down, you know, and I'm not discounting people who do layout because that's a lot of work to get things right. in, in place. So, but still, it's it's a lot cheaper than actually printing the, the full thing out and then saying, right. and saying a, a hardbound or, or softbound uh, copy. Yeah. And everybody around my gaming table is sitting there with a tablet, by the way. They're not sitting right. they, they don't use the game books anymore at all. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, 
having it in a PDF is going to be probably the way that most people will want to go, anyways. Yeah. So except for the so, diehards who really want it hard bound, and I think we should just make that option at whatever price it takes. So I think we should. I think we should like set a drop dead date that we're going to be done with it, no matter what. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd it, much it, rather it, you just set some milestones. Well, I'm just saying that so there's. That we can get, we can do that, but we need to have a date where if we're not finished it by this date, we might as well just, you know, if, if we're not finished by the end of the... Pick a, I'm just saying... If, pick a date. Pick a publishing date. That's fine. Yeah, and we'll blow right through it like we did like we did every time, other times. Because remember, we had... <laughs> well, that's because, that's because you didn't have any other milestones, John. You need Actually, to set smaller well, milestones all the way up to that date, okay? How do you think I was able to make... The D20 one, I mean, granted, you know, it didn't get published because they decided to take Nick Pilata's stuff out of it, but we we spent two months, we got it done. We hit all of our milestones along that way because we set them. So it, it can happen. You just have to know. Yeah. You know. Everyone has to know what the milestones are. Everybody has to be communicating. Everybody has to do the work. And you've okay. wrote shout outs too. What's that? And yeah, and I rough and, and I asked you, where's the material? Where is it? You have a milestone due at this time, and yeah, that's what a project manager does. Yeah. See, uh, you're you're kind of I think you're trying to wear too many hats. I yeah, you need to delegate. When I wrote when I was the project manager on the Bureau Thirteen book, I didn't do that much content in the book. Okay, this is okay. okay. This is this is uh, open secrets. We actually did have a a, a project. We did actually did have a project line. We did have deadlines, and everyone I, I put I signed it to, except for a few people, blew them off. And, they, and it, because unfortunately, I think what happened was that we ended up with too many chiefs and not and not enough Indians. We had too many people saying that, that they're going to run it, and then they went, when they found out they weren't they weren't going to run it, they weren't running it. They just oh, sh- well, yeah, that you have to tell people what their job is, and that's what they're and if they don't want to do it. They can't be in the pool, you know. They can't play in the in our game. That's all there is to it. Yeah, and I think I mean, you know, if you ask me to do something and I don't do it, then you have every right to say, "Hey, sorry, Bruce, but I guess you're not going to be one of the contributors for the game book." Well, right. the, the Frenchworthy book I mean, was was the weekly chats we had where we well, we we didn't we, we you know we 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 had our weekly chats where we nailed down the Bible. Where we sat down and worked out yeah. all the background, you know, and yeah. that, I still have all those chats, you know. And, I have uh, the Bible, and you have the Bible, so yeah, and we still have a lot of this background material that we came up with that I'm also looking at every so often to see what's not in the book. What, what did we leave out that we we thought we were going to include? But, you know, and I am dang double du- sure. Make sure we mention that fringe that the portals give you language. I'm making sure it's mentioned in more than one place. Because that we got that got left out of the D twenty yeah. book. Okay, so so currently, so so John currently, uh, just to make no, sure. There. I told you it's there. The, I showed the it only, to you, John. What? Is it what the the language is in the D twenty? Yes, it's in there. Okay. Okay, is that where I expected it to be? Then I'll tell I'll tell you. Maybe at again. not. Yeah, I mean, it's quite possible. Yeah. Yeah. I, I so, saw a lot of things got moved around. Unexpectedly, after we turned in the manuscript. Yeah, which well, is why I organize it into a player section and a GM section. The, the player information is okay. all over the spot because it shouldn't be spread around in the book. It should be all in one spot. In fact, it should be. All, I'm thinking of seriously okay. of submit of, of if I can convince Richard to, to do a player's book, so that the players have the book and they can they can create the characters and not have any GM secrets. You know, which is I think is important for the game. If, if it's digital, you can sell it as a package. Yep. It's just two files instead of one. Yeah, the GM gets it's the, really not a problem. Yeah, the GM gets the full book. He gets both sections in one book, but the players get the player's guide. You know, a lot of well, games, No, the, GM should, the player's guide should be the player's guide. The GM's guide should be the GM's guide, and he can use both books. I'm looking you know, There's no actually, reason to have it all in one. Well, actually, I'm looking at the way uh, Pinnacle did their books, and they actually, the, GM, the, the book the GM would buy is everything. He has both the players and NG information in one book, while the players can buy okay. a smaller edition. But yeah, well, yeah, that's yeah. Remember the seven deadly sins? Sloth, 
Uh, no, 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 no. The, the, okay, our, our our guest who published that and his oh, yes. PDFs, where you you click on which game version you want and different content becomes visible. Yeah, and GM's book could be the same way. If you're a GM, then you're going to have more content. You know, you just say, "I'm the GM." You click on the button. Your your version has more content than what the players has. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't keep the players from getting the material and reading it if they want to, but we can set it up so they don't see it accidentally. Yeah. Right. So you were saying so so, that's a possibility. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think, as far as I understand at this point, my only responsibility at, at right now is just finishing up my plot points. I don't know that I have any other tasks. Yeah, and I know Paul's doing yeah. a plot point as well. I'm waiting to see if you, I don't, I'll, I'll go bug him about it. Yeah, next time I, I haven't submitted any plot points, and I think that that's probably something I should be doing too. Yeah, one thing I'm thinking also doing, and that because this was done in the in the Red Sands uh, release, is a plot generator. Okay. So that you, you're stuck for an idea. Okay, the, 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 you know, it, it gives you idea things you can you can plug into and and use for an, and create an adventure from if, if you're stuck. You know, you don't have to you don't have to swear by it, but at least it will give you things you can put together into an adventure and take it from there. And that does mean making a enough... A fringe-worthy fringe worthy version of the B-13 and Counter Shark? No, I mean, it's, it's in the Red Sands book. Let me go see. Red Sands. There you go. I have all my books. I need to get myself up front. Now, in their, in, in their book, where is it? Where do they put that? There you go. They have they have an adventure section, page seventy-seven. Yeah, and it's basically it's a series. It's a series of tables you would roll on, and build an adventure from those tables. So you so unlike the the encounter tables in in Bureau thirteen, you could use these to, to basically build different style. They actually have. <laughs> Adventure types. So you you would go for investigation or exploration or or action adventure. adventure type of thing. Yeah, social or or in this case, Victorian pulp is in this book because this is a good a red sands. But yeah, you basically you have different types and they have different sets of tables to roll on to generate the basic framework for the uh, for the adventure. But you flesh it out yourself. Yeah. It does that, however, it does mean making creating enough NPCs in the books that you can so people can just go click. Oh, I need some Victorians. There you go, a bunch of Victorians. I need some pirates. Here's a bunch of pirates. You know, having enough of each, people can pick and pick and choose, and build right. adventures. And uh, you know, uh, oops, and there's Bruce. Where are you going, Bruce? <laughs> Wrong hand. Where are you going, Bruce? Come back. Come back, Bruce. Come back. Reach out. <laughs> yeah, remember, our videos are swaps. You got it. So Bruce is, uh, you know. But, yeah. it's it, Yeah, I've seen that before. Other people are like, I'm talking to John, who's on my left. And it's like, oh, nope, that left. There he is. <laughs> oh, so, Bruce. Uh, back. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, hey, hey, do you know how direction. To... Is there, is there any way to the, the three little boxes down here on the bottom, is there any way to put them up on the top? Uh, no. This is the way Google does it. Because my camera's up top, and it would be, I'd be looking closer to, like, like when I look down, I feel like I'm looking down all the time because I'm looking at you guys talking. You, you want to see my secret for looking at? I have... I put them right next to the camera, so I'm talking to the moose. You put what right next to the camera? Okay. No, I mean, I can see my camera. That's not a problem. Like, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, you don't look at it. You look at the screen. But if I talk, I can talk to the moose because I have, I have eyeballs to look at up there, not the little green light. <laughs> Mine's got a little red light on it. It's like, how? Hey, Pete, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> also, look at myself, too, when I'm talking there like this. I'm talking to myself. Right. So, so, John, what, let, let's, just, let's just throw this out there. What, what kind of realistic, rough date are we talking about? I mean, could we get this thing out this year? We could. I mean, if, it's if, not if, February yet. If I can get if I can get help from folks to like 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 Bruce said, go through the podcast and, and you know and 
I wouldn't say just put, you know, don't put them to the main doc, but just create, you know, either Google Docs or Word Docs, or whatever, whatever works with the missing material. And then well, what's, we need a list of what's missing. What What is missing? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> That's what we said. We look at we go through the we, we go through all the podcasts. We didn't have to listen to them all, but we look through the list and say, "Oh, here's one of the vehicles. What was in the vehicles one?" And you know, and, oh, oh, look all these different vehicles we could, we could have, or, or here's the one uh, something else. Uh, and what were what are we missing from from from? You know, a lot of the early episodes are like that, where there's a lot of, there's a lot of good information in those uh, early episodes, and. I've been trying to mine them myself, but like, like Bruce said, this one person wearing many hats. Right, to... that's what I'm saying. How many developers do we currently really have? And and I would count you and count uh, Peter as a, as like a part time developer, um, uh, and uh, and that's about it. Well, we're all part time, John. Yeah, we're all part time. So just basically us three. And is Trav involved? I haven't got anything for Trap. I think he's been busy with working with Richard on, on on other things, so he's been working yeah. on other other, other uh, items. So I think Trav is a uh, um, sorry Trav. But, uh, well, why don't we Why don't we see if if Paul wants to you know uh, put in some more stuff? I mean, he seems to be into yeah. this. Oh yeah, I mean, right, I'll tell you what. He has, he has uh, what I'll do too is... much Victorian. He's giving way too much Victorian background material I can't even use in the game. So. Right. I... Okay, uh, all right. What I'll do is I'll take the player's guide and I'll re-listen to the first 10 episodes mm -hmm. and I'll tell you any information I think that's in those episodes that's not in the player's guide and then we'll work from there as to say what do we want to develop and what we don't want to develop, okay? Yeah. And then I'll take the next 10 and if someone wants to jump in there and take 10, that's fine. And we'll just work our way through the podcast just to make sure we have that information you know, at least stubbed out in the uh, player's guide. Okay. Yes. And let me let me finish um, let me finish the plot points I'm working on. Uh, yeah, go because ahead. I've already got, like I said, I've got two that are almost completely finished. Um, I got another one that I just started developing, and then it's one more, and then I'm done the plot points that I had planned out. Yeah. So I've I've got two that are. All right, one in the very beginning stages, one that's not written yet, and two that are almost finished. Uh, and then that'll give me six major plot points. Um, and then we can try and think up some other mini ones. I mean, we can even go from the, maybe I can even go from the races. I'll, I'll take each race and try and think of like two or three plot points for each one of them. That's specific to them. Like, uh, take the Demixie, you know, come up with uh, some, like three Demixie specific plot points. Right. Well, I mean, we know that the Demixie point of view is very um, government laissez-faire. Let's just, you know, biz business Uber all. I mean, they're, that's right. why their world is a um, ecological nightmare. Right. We're going to have that same kind of social and business Darwinism aspect. So, you know, you could very well have them running afoul uh, on a world where you know, they run into uh, people, you know, Native Americans that have a, you know, the the more Gaia aspect, and they right. come in, they come in and start strip mining next to them. Right, right, you know? right. We'll get we'll get a little Avatar action going, but with giant spider guys. Ooh, right. Yeah. That or, could be fun. Or, or maybe and, yeah. You know, the other drivers have to come in and negotiate it. Right, and of course. Um, Put something on their home world, you know, have an adventure there of some kind. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, every, every every race should have a, at least one adventure on their world. Oh yeah. I mean, the problem I have is that there's a lot of the races, like the the Erds and some of the other ones. I mean, I really I, we haven't done them on the podcast yet. We I really still don't have a real good sense to what you know. I mean, doing these. Um, character things on the podcast has really fleshed out so many of the races. I mean, I never really thought about the Golden Horde other than kind of being more of a joke until we did the podcast. And I was like, yeah, you know, those guys would be great to run. Now I understand them. So yeah. I think we need to do, do that uh, with the rest of the races probably sooner than later so that we can make sure we have a good basis for these plot points. Yeah, I mean, one thing I discovered when I did some more research 
around the time period that they're stated in the book, which is actually way past the, the actual empire itself. You know, here's the empire still standing. Uh, there would be cities. They would have cities. They wouldn't all be nomadic. Right. You know? oh, yeah. I mean, they, they, come, they come from the very nomadic background, mm -hmm. but at, as they're represented in the current book, they are more of a um, de declining culture. They, they, they've gotten soft. Yeah. And, and you they're, know, they're more Chinese than they are Mongolian. Yep. And they control everything from the, basically from uh, the Atlantic to the Pacific, uh, at least that distance. Now up and down, uh, they can't get into India because, because of uh, the, the Himalayas is too easy. Uh, but uh, Southeast Asia, no problem. Japan, they still got problems with get Japan. Japan still keeps them keeps them out. Um, okay. no, but, but, but yeah, yeah. You, you, but yeah. once they get, but I I can really see them once they get out on the French Pass, mm -hmm. re uh, discovering that uh, old Mongol spirit. Right. You know, so you know, what what Blix was saying, what Peter was saying. Is, could still hold true on the fringe pass, even if their parent culture isn't quite as uh, ex, uh, you know, explorative as, as they used to be. Yeah. I mean, one thing I'm thinking that we, that right now we have, I have a write-up, a really good write-up, what's well, the best I can do right now so far, of the character of the, of the different um, cultures so that, pl that players can read them and have an idea how to play the character. Now, what we're talking about is actually doing a GM write-up about each world. I'm thinking maybe a, a, um, a variation of the uh, of, of our of the node map we used to, we used to we we're used to, we're all used to where we list everything. When it comes to these major races, it's more than just five lines. We're talking like every every world should probably be at the minimum five or six paragraphs, if not more. Well, and so, we right. can, we well, come that's to what I'm saying. Those, worlds. those episodes on the podcast gave you pages and pages of write-up that you could use just by calling it from our podcast. Oh, yeah. Right. I, I basically got to a page and a half for most of the races just so the players can read through it and go, oh, this is a Dunixie. Oh, this this is a Blizzness. Oh, this is, this is how you play a Mongol. Uh, the, the Victorians are, are a playable character right off the bat. I mean, one of the options in the game is you can you can you can you can play it either as Idet or play as as, uh, as Taze. You know, the GM wants to run it, run Fringe really and run, run it so that it's, it's Taze characters instead. I, you can do that right off, right from the get go. Hey, I, I got I got one for you, John. What's that? What are you doing with the Chileans? What Chileans? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. The, the situation, I mean, more and more I read about Chile, and more and more I read about how the culture and everything, it's never, it would never happen. They'd lease that portal to the UN before they would try to take it over and keep it for themselves. Right. At least they would lease it to the UN for large sums of money, you know. And yeah. Africa yeah. is Africa is, is too... too there, there actually is an African Union. There are actually several cross algebra unions, but the biggest problem is that there's tribal... Uh, issues between the two between in, in there, yeah, right? A lot, of, a lot of the issues in Africa is tribal, and you would never see them come together as one big whole because of that. Well, you know, they said that about the Arabs until they formed the uh, OPEC. Yeah, but OPEC ties them together. But that's the point. The ASA ties well, them together. Well, actually, sort of ties them together until you actually get into the politics of OPEC, then you realize, well, the Saudis rule over everyone else and tell them tell them what to do. Uh, but the, their power is starting to wane the, these years. Uh, you, you're certainly wondering if OPEC's becoming a um, who's the biggest world producer of oil these days? United States. We're producing more oil than anyone else is right now. Are we really? Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. So are you it, sure it's not Canada. Canada's like second. <laughs> it know, doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. The point yeah. is, John. It, that if you don't want them as part of the base book, that's fine. You know, we should just put them in as an appendix. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't. I don't think. You know, the ASA. I've always questioned. Uh, once, yeah. I mean, would you set it twenty years in the future? Then you, you can keep doing that because anything can happen in twenty years. Yeah. But if you're going to set it as a near future, 
then you're kind of limited by the existent politics in your world. Yeah. So it's. I mean, you know, I, I, it's, would that be, I would be. I would. Maybe a real issue as far as putting it into the next book because of that. Yeah. I would just suggest that you have a long conversation with Richard about it. Yeah. Because if we take it out and Richard wants it in, he's going to put it right back in. Yeah, that's I right. I definitely will have a conversation with him. One thing I'm, uh, we're going to nail down, and, and I, this is why I want to do a, a change in how we do the 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 uh, the, uh, the platform write ups is make sure that we basically say, okay, locked, 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 except for one, Hasumi. Uh, I was, right. look, I was looking at D twenty yeah. book. I was looking at D twenty book. There's four portals open on the main platform. I know. <laughs> I know. That's what I told him. I told him not to do that. Yeah, as soon as soon as you get up 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 there, in the, in the Russian and, and the uh, and the Canadian or America, or I can't remember. I don't remember if it's in, in Canada or Alaska. It's hard to find the map. Um, but if those two are found, bye bye bye, Hasumi. No one's going to go down there anymore. Yeah, right. We know that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, especially you know, uh, yeah. I mean, if but anyway, that's that's you know the the. I might it's one just... of the reasons I think that Richard is redoing his portal books because they're becoming less of a map and more of a notebook of reminiscences. Yeah, or a suggestion or Which idea. I think is fine because yeah. you know the maps were great for people who really needed something solid to work from, but. Uh, I think it, it was, it, in a lot of ways, it, it kind of bottlenecked a lot of other people's creativity because all of a sudden they said, well, I, I want to make a world, but they're all used up. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'd much what... rather have a portal and say there's eight portals on this world, and one of them is open, and this is the one, this is what it says. And the rest of them, these if there's any strange indicators on the mark, them go ahead and say that and just let the the uh, GM fill in the rest. I mean, I'm half tempted that basically, if it's locked, it's GM fillable. So that means well, I'm... they should almost all be locked. I mean, there should only be one, maybe two portals open on any platform. Except, I... Uh, well, I was thinking of having three open on on, on the Earth, on Earth Prime. That is, of course, the uh, Alt Zero Two, which is the uh, the the uh, Victor. We call it Victorians Two, but I'm starting to call them. You're talking about the alt platform. Yeah, the alt platform. America, America never, ne never had fought a war, basically, a re revolution. So basically, it's the, the American Dominion uh, world. Then you have the junkyard, and then you have um, the hunting lodge. Those three are open, and each one of them provides s safe adventuring. Well. Mostly safe. Mostly safe adventuring. <laughs> well, I was, yeah, John, and we've talked about this before. It's really best, I mean, that's fine, have a couple of them open on, our, on around us, but um, for the most part, the default position is locked. Yes. You know, that is the default position. They're, they're all locked in, unless you need something to be there. And we don't tell, and we don't say in GM it's locked with this little crystal. No, it's locked when you decide to unlock it. Right, it's it's locked with whatever crystal you need it to be locked with. Yeah. So, you know, and and and, and then and but also to make our book smaller, I hate to say this, and you know for like you know the zero in the zero three position, it's it's locked and there's no description. It's for you, the GM, to fill out. Right. For you, the GM, to create your own little world to put back there. You know, if you want to put another in the world, go right ahead. Or if yeah, you want to use the yeah, it's like in the, in the module, the, the Keep on the Borderlands, they had the Caves of Mystery. It was for you to put your dungeon. Right. Yeah. And you could, I mean, you could also, um, I mean, you could use the portal books if you wanted to. Yeah. But it's yeah. up to you. You can replace any one of those you want with whatever world you need it to be. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. can do that right now. I mean, uh, the I, I would suggest to Richard, if you really, really want to do it, just take the existing portal books and just pulling out information, the, the good stuff, the stuff he really likes, and making just one big portal book. Right. Have, you know, yeah. all, the, all the good stuff in it. The good, the good well, parts. Well, another good use of the portal books is if you wanted to start your game in, let's say, the middle or late campaign, Yeah. then you go and say, okay, I've got like dozens and dozens of portals that aren't too interesting, but they're there, 
And so uh, they're on the map. You know, we're still some, the, still the ones I think are the most interesting. Those are the ones I'm going to leave locked. But all the rest of them I can leave, you know, I can say to the players, here's what they found on these worlds. And, but, you know, and, and therefore they, the GM doesn't have to do all that work of detailing the humongous history of all the portals that have been discovered and investigated. Mostly what we've been discovering in the last 10 years is a lot of boring places, except for the couple of places that you want to include in your game. Yeah. So it does no. have that use. You know, another thing I, I just I was just thinking of we could do is is we could like you were saying take all the interesting worlds out that are that are that you want to you want to keep the ones that you really like put them in a in a book put them in a specific place, but right. then all the ones that are just like you know a wooded field, you know, or you know the ones that don't really have much description, empty take, another stinking swamp. Right, right. <laughs> take take all those ideas, right. Don't fill those worlds out. Leave those blank behind locked doors, right? But take each one of those ideas and put it into that world generator thing that you were talking about so that right. that world you're talking about, it'll come up eventually, you know, but mm -hmm. um, we, we could just we could really simplify it that way so you don't have to fill out all that information, um, and, but it's still all at your fingertips, you know. It's like, oh, all right, well, you guys open this door and it's going to be, a, oh, look, a sticky swamp. You know, it's like, again... It's like, well, that's what I rolled. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But then you, you know, but then you throw in the other elements. Okay, so it's a stinky swamp. Okay, well, how's it inhabited? Oh, look at that, dangerous predators. You know, well, you might not tell them that, but <laughs> or it might say, you know, fu cute fuzzy guys. If you have, you know, as the time goes on in your campaign, you have other teams out there exploring, not your teams. Right. Uh, you want your players to play the at in the most interesting places. So they're going to be the ones finding all the less interesting places. They're going to be the ones slogging around the stinking swamps that don't have anything in them. Right. And that's fine, you know. Uh, and and they get to, you get to put the reports in, and they get to flesh out their fringe maps slowly, you know. And you keep uh, and you put all the interesting places in that world generator. So when you roll the dice, you're going to come up with an interesting world for your players to go to. They know that it's a meta game concept. Yeah. Right. One thing I've been noticing at running a Year Zero game was how much time my players take exploring a world. Even when they're told, go in and come out, they'll take up to a week or more exploring a world in game time. Of course they do. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've never, you know, <laughs> we played, we used to play on a regular basis when we were playing just straight up Fringeworthy. Oh, dude, we would just we would just roll through a door, no precautions, didn't matter. We'd just drive right on through, no helmets on, no gas mask, none of that stuff. And then we'd get in there, and dude, we would look around for weeks finding stuff and getting involved with stuff and messing with things. And our characters would return like a month later to IDET, you know, and, and the game has to be like, where the hell have you guys been? Why don't you just go in there and look? You know, it's like, oh, we found this stuff, and we came back with these items, and, you know, and... Everybody does it. Of course, it's the nature of players. I mean, yeah. that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're having fun. They're like, well, go back home. No, that's boring. Give me some dice. I'm going to go kill some stuff. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what players do. Give me some ruins. Right. Give me oh, some my, treasure. Oh, my players. Give me, give me a strange alien artifact humming and floating in the air somewhere yeah. that I have, to get, I have to build a boat to get to. Right, exactly. Oh, wait a minute. My, my players spent Is that a Chrome time. reference? No. Okay. Sorry, I thought it was my, my players spent five weeks on Victorian Prime before they finally left, you know, and I had to send them home. I actually had to give them a reason to go home. I thought they they, they just was stayed there, so they had to take they had to take back a diplomatic, diplomatic pouch with the current negotiations. So because basically the team one was there as well, but they're busy negotiating with the Victorians, and they had to basically got to a point where it's we need a decision. It's like, okay, you guys, go home. Yes, go home. Well, Bureau 13 world is a fringe world. And yeah. as we all know, people can run entire campaigns on that world alone because they do. So yeah. it makes perfect sense. If you give enough detail for your world, you make your world interesting enough, why would they ever want to go? They still have more stuff to find on the world. Yeah. Oh, I'll let you guys know we're, we're scheduled for just a few more. Uh, we're only scheduled to eight, and it's getting close to that time, looks like. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's fine. 
Okay, so that's that's where we are right now. You yeah, know, we we, we definitely. All right, so our our goals, just so you guys know, our goals are set some milestones, set some hard and fast dates, and divvy up tasks. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, I'm writing plot points. Bruce is going to start going through and picking through the episodes and trying to find all the goodness that we've talked about because there's a lot of goodness, in it, especially in our first year. Because that's all we the players' guide or the GM's guide, yeah. Right. And that was, I mean, if you think about our first year, that was their fringe, this pure fringe where that's all we thought about, that's all we talked about. Right. So it there's going to the be a lot. Podcast. <laughs> right. And there's going to be a lot of good stuff in there. So, um, let me go back and start working on the on the pirate section, which I actually have. I did flesh out a bit more. And I did use some of your ideas, Peter. But like I said, good. I used the idea. I didn't may not use the actual text you created, but I used the ideas and came up well, with a way where you can build pirate teams based on what you want. <laughs> What what the ha want to happen? That's fine, John. And, and like I said before, I really think that a lot of that text that I put in there would be great for plot points. I think I'm gonna just I'm gonna take that stuff and stick it in the plot points where applicable because I think that was that was really more of a story type yeah, stuff one -pagers. that I did. So it'd be good for that. One pagers, you know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. One pagers, and you know, definitely start working on. Uh, the, the world, the, the platform descriptions, so that you know, we come up, basically, I hate to say, it, come up with another new way of doing platform descriptions. We're, how many different ways have we done so far? So that you know, we only, only those only those doors that are open are open. I will I will list where all the portals are on Earth Prime, and I'll and, I'll, and try to get some more fleshed out detail. In fact, the very first adventure, uh, Victoria Victorians. Takes place on eight eight zero two, which is really fleshed out. It's like if you look at that adventure, it's it's fairly long. It's a fairly involved adventure, uh, and then there's one that takes place in Pax Romana, which when I run it, actually only goes for uh, game time runs about three or four days, uh, but it could really be one you can take a long time to play through if you do do so. But you know, provide background like. Uh, the junkyard. What's in the junkyard? You know, you know, we, we have it. We have the junkyard. We we never really said what's on the junkyard pocket stop. You know, we never actually have sort of fleshed that out and say, okay, you know, what's your chance of finding something good? You know, Paul, Paul brought this up. Take take a team. Send them to the junkyard. Dig. Right. What are you gonna find? You know, you know, you're gonna find stuff. And is it you gonna be alien stuff? It could be good stuff. Is it gonna be all trash? Even the trash may be valuable. Watch I mean, some episodes of American Picker. Yeah. <laughs> Get Lovejoy out there, you know. He's out there divvying if you're on right. the old TV show. But, but I, think the, I think the bottom line is no matter what we do, we need to consider the time impact on anything we decide to do, especially anything extra. You know, If we're talking about, hey, we should add this in, we should add that in, we need to make sure that we do a time assessment on that and say, well, that's great. It'd be great to have it in there, but is that something we can do as a supplement instead? Because we could. There's nothing going to stop us from doing, you know, like four or five page PDFs that you could just download, even if we give it away for free or sell it for a dollar. Yeah, I mean, at least with the known races, each one of their worlds should be fleshed out to the point where it is at least a page, a page and a half worth of material. If we can even get a map, that'd be wonderful. Right. But uh, but at least you know, like for the Mongols, at least a page and a half of the world and some potential plot points. Right. I'm seriously thinking that you know the Mongol, uh, actually saying, and when you go to the Mongol world, you will find you you will encounter that the Khan's youngest daughter is fringeworthy, and he he sends her along because he realizes he's facing a major power. And what do and what does he do with major with 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 people he encounters and and and, and conquers? He takes hostages. He's viewing mm -hmm. his daughter as a hostage. Tied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, so and then they're tied to him. Yeah, and they're tied to him. Yeah. And especially if she gets involved with one of them, you know, like yeah. especially if she marries one of them, and then now that's you know the Khan is that guy's father-in-law, and you know, well, shoot, half of that. Japanese animation involves the you know the the, the in-laws showing up. <laughs> right, right. And they always turn out to be some king or, you know, some god or, or something or other. <laughs> right, right. All right, so is this thing going to automatically end? Why not or... be the god? Why not no, the I have, god? I'll have to end it. So well, we probably want to do a wrap-up. Um, well, let me do this because it is Savage World. So, folks, we are working on the game. 
we are we like I said we have 112 pages in the game so far, and it is a, and I am doing an open design. So if you if you I'll add to the notes a link to the Google to the Google uh, share where all the stuff is, so you can take a look at it and comment yourself. I mean, you know, I may not be able to address all comments, but I, I do I do encourage people to comment and and make suggestions on how things can you know how things can work. I've already gone through several comments from folks about you know making changes, which I've had which I've gone through and done and and <laughs> discovered. Though I'm very very familiar with it, I never knew about, especially in the new deluxe book. So uh, so I've been I've been taking people's suggestions and, and fixing things and correcting things and and or at least I will look at it and I and if I decide not to do it I will tell you I won't do it but why I won't do it. So but I do appreciate all the feedback and it will help us get this thing done faster. You know if we get your feedback. So I guess uh, until next time, thank you for watching. And have a good and have a good night or good day or whatever. <laughs> good night, right, guy. See you later. Yep. Yo, brothers, this was the Tri Tech Games podcast. You know the drill. It's protected under the Creative Commons license 3.0. No commercial reproduction. No derivatives. And sucker, you best attribute this to the folks at Tri Tech Games. And if you don't, we'll be after your sorry butts, cause we're some bad mothers. <laughs> <laughs>